Um, most of you know who I am already. I'm Bill Cross. I'm the head here in Aeronautics and Astronautics. And I have the pleasure to introduce my colleague, who's then going to introduce our, our keynote speaker this afternoon. So I'm going to introduce Professor Steve Heaster. Steve has been with us for a little longer than I have been, so I'm not going to tell you how long that is, because I started when I was 12, and Steve started when he was 15 here. So I'm 38, and Steve is, yeah, right? Yeah, OK. Uh, Steve is our Raysbeck Distinguished Professor in Aeronautics and Astronautics. He's actually was the, formerly was the director for our, the first Rolls-Royce University Technology Center in the United States on high Mach propulsion. He's got a, a huge, outstanding reputation and career in all kinds of propulsion things, liquids, hybrids, rotating detonation engines, Mach 6, well, no, I'm being a little silly now. But I, more seriously, Steve is one of our highly accomplished faculty members, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce Steve Heaster to you. Well, thanks, thanks Bill, uh, uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker here today. Uh, brings back, actually, fond memories. Um, I have been at Purdue a long time, almost 30 years. And uh, as you uh, reminisce back and think about events, right, there are things tend to blur together. But there are a few events that you remember very poignantly in your mind. And, and, and Beth is actually associated with one of those. So I'd like to share it with you before I go into the formal introduction. She's, she's wincing now. <laughs> so you know, we have evening exams. Uh, and uh, we have uh, alternate seating. So often we get placed in, in uh, rooms like these that are tiered. And I, I hand out all the exams. And Beth always was, as a student, she liked to be in front. And uh, so she sat in front for the exam that evening. And I hand out all the exams, came back, and I sat down at the, at the main table. And I, and I looked up, and the students were all starting to, uh, uh, to work on their tests. And, and I looked over, because I was lower, and uh, the students were a little higher, I looked over, and I saw Beth's feet. And there were two. I think they were fuzzy rabbit sl slippers. <laughs> and that's the first and last time I've ever seen a student put on slippers uh, to take a test. Uh, but obviously, it worked for her because uh, she was a very good student um, and uh, I think uh, an incredible mentor, actually, and very appropriate speaker here today, uh, tremendously accomplished in the industry. Uh, she had, uh, uh, you know, a very, uh, very, very good uh, credentials here at Purdue. But I think more, more than that, she has the uh, things that we don't measure very well in a university: uh, the ability, actually, to listen and work with people, and uh, and really understand uh, the human dynamic. And uh, that's that's an, an area where we don't we don't mark down grades, but uh, it absolutely makes a, makes a big difference in the world and in, uh, in, in uh, industry. And uh, that's obviously why she's gotten to where she is. Uh, with that, I'd, I think I'd like to introduce her and not take, take up uh, too much of her time. Uh, but we need to ask her if she actually put on the slippers when she made it to, to space. <laughs> Beth, please, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Easter. OK, so this is the first test. Can you walk and chew gum at the same time? I, yes, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. But I have somehow a microphone, a few notes for one part of my talk, and a clicker. So just forgive me right now if I am you know, drop anything. Um, in fact, I may put the notes down for just the moment I need them. And I'm going to try the clicker in the right hand. Uh, OK, so. Hello, I'm glad everybody's here. Thank you for making time to come to such an important summit on your weekend. And for those of you, anyone that came from far away, it's, it's great that you're all here. Uh, I'm going to give, I think, I think this is the industry keynote for this event, if I'm not mistaken. Arlie's shaking her head back there. OK, great. Um, so I'm going to speak from an industry perspective. Uh, I am, uh, by way of introduction, my name is Beth. I was obviously a Purdue Aero and Astro student. I got my bachelor's and my master's here through the School of Aeronautical and Astronautical Engineering. And I uh, loved it when I wasn't hating it. <laughs> I did wear lucky slippers to exams now and then for the, uh, the especially tough professors <laughs> who gave especially uh, tough exams. Um, but I'm very, very grateful for my education. And I try to you know, give my time back to Purdue any way that I can. And I'm happy to help anyone associated with Purdue in any way that I can. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. I worked at NASA's Johnson Space Center on the International Space Station program for many years. And then when space station assembly was complete, 
I looked around and the private human spaceflight industry was coming into its own. Uh, and I judged that exciting. Uh, so I joined Virgin Galactic. So I'm now an aerospace engineer at Virgin Galactic. I've been there for about six years now. I'm the chief astronaut instructor, which means I will train all of our customers, our passengers, to fly to space. It also means that I train anyone who flies to space in our cabin to test our cabin before we start commercial service. Uh, in that role, I trained our first astronaut who tested our cabin in space earlier this year, which was myself. I was a horrible student. I didn't wear my lucky slippers. <laughs> um, I also had independent evaluators certifying me as ready for that flight, so I wasn't grading my own test in my slippers. Um, but I did fly to space uh, in February of this year to test our cabin so that we can make our way towards starting commercial service. So that's a little bit of background, and, and I'll take you through some more details. Uh, so I have a few slides, um, a video, a couple of more slides, and then, I'm, and then I'm happy to take questions. If I go too fast or you want to throw a question in the middle, feel free. This is sort of casual among friends, I think. At least I'd like to treat it that way. Okay, so, hey, I got it right. <laughs> uh, so, there are 573 humans, individual humans, that have ever been to space. I was number 571. 72 and 3 are currently on the space station. I like to joke that that makes me the newest astronaut on the planet. I'm the baby astronaut. Uh, you have at least one more sitting in this room right now, maybe more. Raise your hand if you've been to space. Oh, he, he took the bait. <laughs> um, so my point is not about Gary or myself. My point is that that's a very small number. Uh, that's about twice as many, maybe a little bit more than twice as many as the number of people in this room. So think of yourself, put your favorite friend to your right, put your favorite enemy to your left. That's it. That's the total number of people that have ever been to space. Um, and our aim at Virgin Galactic is to massively increase that. We are not the only private commercial company working in this area. I'm obviously gonna speak for Virgin Galactic today, but there are others that are striving toward that under different paradigms, fully private, public and private, uh, NASA contracts, billionaire funding. Uh, Blue Origin was on the panel earlier today. I don't know if Yen is in the room. Ah, hello. <laughs> um, and also, Boeing Starliner and SpaceX Crew Dragon are about to become human-rated systems. Uh, human spaceflight is expanding beyond the, tr the traditional government role right now, and it's an exciting time to be in the industry. And we are all trying to increase this number. Uh, so at Virgin Galactic, we have a spacecraft, Unity, that's hanging from a catamaran-style mothership, White Knight. And our founder is, oh my gosh, this is weird. There are two, it's like stereo up here. Uh, <laughs> pick whichever screen you want to focus on, but our founder, Sir Richard Branson, is the blonde-haired man in the middle of this shot. Uh, we have over 600 customers that have already purchased tickets to fly as uh, customers, tourists, on our spacecraft. Uh, they're waiting for us to start commercial service as we finish up testing. There are already more people ticketed to fly to space total than have ever flown before. That sort of says something. Uh, and this is probably the tip of the iceberg because you know, our commercial director gives talks and asks everybody, who wants to go to space? So I'll ask, who wants to go? And immediately many hands come up. So we, we hope and we think and we really sort of feel in our hearts that this is the tip of the iceberg for, for not just our company but all companies. Uh, so, so, where are we on this? Uh, let me give a few stats, and then I'll show the video next. So, forgive me, uh, because I am deeply respectful of the programs that have come before that have enabled this program, and I am massively cheerleading all the companies that are trying to do this, and the companies like Blue that are just about to reach this as well. But we are sort of standing at a strange for me, awkward moment in history because I'm about to read a bunch of stats and it's gonna sound like an I love me page. I am deeply respectful of the past and the future, but we're also lucky to be standing here. Where are we in this particular program, Virgin Galactic? Uh, in December of last year, December 13th, 
Unity reached space for the first time on a test flight above Mojave Air and Space Fort in California. Two of our pilots, our test pilots, uh, Mark Forger Stuckey and CJ Sturkow, retired shuttle astronaut, piloted Unity to space. So that made Unity the first commercial space vehicle to put humans into space. And that was the first crewed space launch from US soil since the shuttle was retired. The government gap has not been closed, but America has returned to launching humans to space from American soil. We did that last year. So thanks, America. <laughs> um, then 10 weeks later, we repeated that on February 22nd of 2019, Unity flew to space again. This time it took a crew of three, two pilots, Dave Mackay and Mike Masucci, and one test engineer. We learned enough on the December flight to realize that we were ready to start testing the cabin. If my pilots were here, they would make the pilot joke of, well, the mannequin that flew in December, we just swapped that dummy for another dummy. <laughs> and put Beth in the cabin. <laughs> so I strapped all the sensors on and, uh, and had a timeline and uh, executed a test in the cabin. Uh, and it worked. Uh, the idea was to fly to space, unstrap, take ratings, take data, execute the systems for our customers, at least the initial systems. Uh, and we hoped that conditions in space would allow me to safely unstrap. We didn't know until we got there, uh, but, it, but they did. Uh, so I was able to unstrap. So on February 22nd, 2019, three of us flew to space. I unstrapped, I did my test, I strapped back in. Uh, and and that, that means the following are somehow amazingly true. <laughs> uh, it, that was the, or I was, I was, the first non-pilot crew member flown on a commercial space vehicle. That means the first passenger on a space vehicle. I was doing work, but first time someone's flown a passenger to space on a commercial space vehicle. Also, the first one, flown above Mach 3. The Concorde didn't go to Mach 3, but humanity has now reached a point where a commercial vehicle can fly someone faster than Mach 3. That bodes well for fast transport in the future. Uh, I was also the first non-pilot crew member to unstrap and float freely on a commercial space vehicle. Uh, also, the first one ever to unstrap and float in weightlessness on subor in a suborbital space flight. None of the other suborbital astronauts had ever done that. They were all strapped in flying. <laughs> um, and this next one, we don't, we don't talk about it right down, we Virgin Galactic. But I'm going to guess that history is going to show this next one is meaningful in some odd way. It means that I'm the only person who's ever unstrapped, been weightless, and floated freely in a spacecraft that has come to a stop above the Earth. Because our ship is ballistic. We go straight up, cut the rocket motor off, coast as high as we can, come to a stop, and then come back down. So I was weightless in the cabin, actually right behind our two pilots who were still strapped in, when the vehicle coasted, came to a stop, and came back down. And I'll talk a little bit about, more that, what, about what that felt like soon. And all of the future people that fly in our ship and unstrap and fly in New Shepard and unstrap, they will all experience that. But right now, I'm the only one who has. Oh my god, it's magic. I suspect for the rest of you know, time, people will be talking about that. And I would kill to go to the space station, but I'll trade you Mach 25 for Mach 0 any day, because that's just magic, being weightless and still above the Earth. Uh, so that, that's probably my whole speech right there. But anyway, I have, to, I have charts on that later. <laughs> um, so that was February. Uh, so this is sort of a, a moment in history. Uh, so now, you know, what's happened since then? Now what, what's going on? What are we doing? Uh, so all five of the Virgin Galactic astronauts that flew were awarded our astronaut wings. In fact, I'm, in fact, I'm wearing my astronaut wings. We've all been awarded our astronaut wings by the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Um, and we as a company, we have taken the next giant step toward commercial service. We were doing our test flights in California, but we will be operating commercially in New Mexico at Spaceport America. 
and we've initiated the move to New Mexico. We've moved our mothership, our staff, I bought a house. <laughs> so we're starting to move to the commercial spaceport, which is purpose-built for commercial use. It's fancy. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I'll uh, show a video of our last flight, and then I'll take you sort of step by step through that last flight with some more slides. If this works. Nope. Well, there was a video on that black screen. Did you all catch it? Let me see if I have to initiate it from the laptop. Just a moment. Welcome to Space Scotland. <laughs> Congrats, Steve. Welcome to the club, astronaut. <laughs> Thanks, Space. I like, right. I like this club. That was a huge team effort. Let me just recap very briefly. Uh, the reason for the bagpipes is that uh, the pilot in command, our commander on that mission, Dave Mackay, who's the chief pilot for Virgin Galactic, is Scottish, and it's the first time a Scot has been in space. Uh, the, um, the right seat pilot, Mike Such Masucci, Such, he's our lead trainer pilot. Uh, the pilots train themselves using White Knight and Spaceship. And then our chief astronaut instructor was conducting the test in order to train our customers in the future. That was obviously myself. So that's who you saw in the video and the flight you saw. Uh, so I'll take you briefly through the beats of the flight. I am sure you are all going to be, you know, engineers, scientists, poets, explorers, ticket holders, I don't know, but come, come to space with me. I'll tell you what it would be like. Uh, you would start if you came on the Virgin Galactic trip. Uh, you would come to New Mexico, let's say over a weekend, and you would have three days of training followed by space flight on day four. And you would do that here at our facility in New Mexico. This is Spaceport America. You can see on the right, really, really large hangar doors. Uh, the spaceport is built for two motherships and five spacecraft. You can see mothership and Unity spacecraft in the foreground here. And then on the left, your left, you can see basically three floors. Uh, the first floor is a kitchen, barista, friends and family area. This is where your friends and family would watch you fly. The second floor is operations, mission control. It's where my desk is now. Uh, and the third floor is customer training and medical. So you would train there. And then on day four, you would board Spaceship Two, which is the one in the middle. If you look closely, you can see some legs hanging out the hatch. <laughs> uh, in the morning, 
And I would strap you in, and your pilots would strap into the cockpit. And then takeoff is very much like a conventional aircraft. It's the runway takeoff. Um, it doesn't feel especially fast or slow. It just feels like a runway takeoff. But White Knight is a high lift mothership. The, uh, the angle of climb is fairly steep coming right off the runway. So in the back, you, you know the moment of wheels up and you're tipped back. Every seat has a window, private window. Every seat is a window seat and an aisle seat. <laughs> there are six in Spaceship Two. Uh, so you have a window next to you and you have a smaller window above you. I like to joke that it's your own sunroof, but you can't open it. <laughs> um, and then uh, the cockpit isn't sealed off. You can see and talk to your pilots and you're on comm. So I'll strap you in and we'll do comm check and you make sure you can see, see and hear everybody else in the vehicle. You'll take off. Uh, then you'll climb to 45,000 feet. And the White Knight pilots, so there are two pilots in the right-hand fuselage of White Knight, two pilots in spaceship, no pilots in the left, nobody in the left-hand fuselage of White Knight. Uh, the White Knight two pilots will say, three, two, one, release, release, release. And then spaceship free falls from White Knight. From your seat, you feel a free fall. Uh, I was highly trained. Uh, it's a three second free fall. It felt like about three times that. There's a little bit of time dilation because you're really hoping the rocket motor <laughs> lights. It, it does, it's reliable. But you're, <laughs> you're, you're eagerly anticipating your ride to space. You're like, come on, come on. <laughs> uh, and you can see White Knight sort of out your window heading up. Uh, the rocket motor lights three seconds later. It's actually very smooth. It's loud, but smooth. You know it's lit and you're pushed back in your seat. Um, <laughs> you go zero to 60 in less than a second, 0.8 of a second. You have no clue that you've done that, but you do know that you've gone supersonic eight seconds later because your pilots are calling mock cues to each other. So in my case, Such was calling out mock numbers. Uh, so. You hear Mach 1 and you know you're going fast. <laughs> uh, and then the pilots trim, pitch up to space. Um, and you feel that. So you're initially accelerating. You get pushed back in your seat about 3.5 G. And then the pilots turn towards space, which pushes you down in your seat about 3.5 G. You can see that turn to space, the gamma turn. Oh, the rocket motor has lit. <laughs> and you can see that turn to space. Uh, here, you can see the plume from the hybrid rocket motor. Uh, during that turn uh, to space, you're at an altitude where the sky outside has gone purple. It started blue, it's about to be black, it's gone purple, and you're compressed in your seat. My overall impression of that gamma turn was uh, it lasted a little less than two breaths. It felt compressive, but more than feeling it, which I was trained for, I sort of sensed it as a purple murky time frame. So there was two breaths of purple murky, and then you're flat on your back going straight up where you want to go. <laughs> uh, the rocket motor fires for 60 seconds. This is a view of our tail cone cam looking aft down at the Earth. So this is 60 second rocket ride. Uh, you can see the Earth below, you can see the snow, you can see the mountains. It's a smooth motor. You know, you're not sitting there chattering. This is one of the things we were testing. The dummy that flew before me was totally outfitted with vibe sensors, and we didn't expect it to be vibrational, and it wasn't. Um, but it is, you know, increasingly faster and faster. Uh, you can't see, well, my pilots flew so true that there was no wobble. I couldn't ever see the horizon out my window. It was just a black window and increasing to Mach 3 feeling pushed back in my seat, and continuing to be glad that we were going further up. In fact, I told my pilots before my flight, you can hear a pin drop in our mock-up. I kept saying, even without calm, they'd be able to hear me. Well, they land and they say, oh, we're surprised. We heard you say up, up a few times. Yes. <laughs> you just keep going straight up. Uh, it's, a, it's a great ride. It's a really great ride. Um, so then, after 60 seconds, the rocket motor cuts off. You don't lurch forward into your straps, although you do know that the rocket motor is cut off. It's suddenly silent. You suddenly feel 
still in your seat, and you're weightless. Uh, for my test, since it was the first time anyone had done this, we took some time. Um, the pilots first judged that the vehicle was safe, there were no anomalies occurring, the rates were stable, and cleared me out of my seat. Welcome to Weightlessness, Charlie, you're clear to unstrap. And then I independently, as the first evaluator of the cabin, made a quick scan of the cabin and the rates and my own condition and judged myself as safe to unstrap and the cabin as a safe test environment and unstrapped. Uh, all of that happened in microsecond. Uh, but you unstrap and you don't float up in weightlessness. That's a common misconception. Um, if anyone's done parabolic flight testing, some, we've had some Purdue students do parabolic flight testing. Uh, weightlessness is the same, whether it's space or parabolic flight testing. Everybody smiles, everybody laughs. It feels natural, it feels comfortable, intuitive, easy. It's just great fun, everybody loves it. Uh, so I unstrapped and headed right to my window. That's rocket motor cutoff. At this point, I'm unstrapping. And that was my reaction. <laughs> I think someone earlier today mentioned on, the, on our panel mentioned this photo. Um, so if you look closely, you can tell I'm not strapped in any longer. That gray strap is my, part of my seatbelt. Uh, and you can now see our ship has started to feather. Uh, the boom folds up uh, for entry, stable entry. And you can see the limb of the earth. At this point, you're free to roam about the cabin, be weightless, enjoy it. Uh, I was on a strict timeline of uh, ratings, places, and data I needed to take. So I started that timeline. I am so jealous of our customers and even our future test subjects that won't be so constrained because you can just go anywhere you want. I figure folks will you know, immediately look out the window and then high five each other and then hugs and then tumbles and whatever you choose to do, uh, we'll, we'll, you can enjoy and we'll work out all of that in training. If you want to tumble through the middle of the cabin and you want to go to your window, you know, we'll work out how to do that. <laughs> um, but I went up for part of my test and checked out the view from the upper cockpit windows, which is as amazing as you would think it is. Uh, and then I purposely positioned myself near the pilots and near our front cockpit windows for apogee, that moment, the highest point of our flight, where we're just stable, stationary, above the earth. And we all greatly enjoyed that. Um, what you don't see in this photo, or even in the video, is sort of what came next. We celebrated the fact that we had gotten this far collectively as a program. But then a hush sort of came over all three of us, and Forger and CJ report the same thing from their flight. The view of Earth from Apogee is just astounding and magic, and that feeling of being hovering over it is astounding and magic. I alluded to it earlier. I'll tell you explicitly about the view now. Uh, space is very, very dark, just blacker than black. And the Earth below us was very, very high definition, uh, very crisp, very clear, very bright, like you know, more so than you can sort of imagine. It was just super high def. The day we flew, there was snow on the mountains in the southern, southern California in the southern part of the US. And I found myself later trying to describe it to a journalist and saying that I thought Earth was wearing her diamonds that day for us because they were just such glistening snow caps on the mountains spread out below us. Uh, we can see a thousand miles. Um, you can see sort of around the curve of the Earth a little bit. Uh, there was the blue ocean, the brown and green land, these white snow-capped mountains, and the black of space. And and pictures don't do it justice. I thought I knew what Earth looked like from space because I spent my entire career in human spaceflight. I mean, sometimes studying those. And now I know what, I'm, what I've not been seeing. It's just so bright. Um, I'm on a tangent. I am really looking forward to the day that it's not just you know, pilots and astronauts that fly to space, it's poets and artists as well because I feel like I don't have the language to describe what it's like in sort of a human emotional way. I can, I can describe my test findings you know, to the 10th degree in very numeric detail, but describing the experience is very difficult. So poets and artists, please sign up. <laughs>
Uh, but that's Apogee, and I really, I really think it's amazing. Um, after Apogee, I then continued my test about the cabin, and at some point, you're heading back toward the atmosphere. The pilots let you know it's time to get back in your seat. I unstrapped two different ways. I strapped back in two different ways, looking at timings and techniques. Uh, and then it's time for entry. Um, we enter in a feathered configuration, which means our booms are folded up so that we're like a shuttlecock and inherently stable. Once we come through the atmosphere, which is another sort of three and a half G, two breath sort of compression experience, uh, which is amazing, by the way, entry is a really good bookend to boost. Entry does hit for folks in seats in the cabin about three and a half G. And it lets you know that you've just been somewhere special and just done something amazing. It's kind of the natural bookend to boost. Uh, but then uh, the pilots defeather the ship. It goes back to a glider. And you glide back to land on the same runway you took off of for a big Virgin-style party at Spaceport America. And so that would be your flight. But I, I think it's more than that. We, we sort of all do this for an inher inherent sense of passion about humanity and human spaceflight. Um, and so regardless of our flight or our company or my flight or, or, or anything like that, uh, I'd like to show two quick photos. This is the first photo of Earth from space taken from, I think it was a V2, but a missile launched from White Sands, which is where our company is going to fly commercially. Uh, and just, you know, an automated camera. The canister was scooped up off the desert floor afterwards, and people took a look at the first photo ever of Earth from Space, 1946. Uh, I think this was the start of something that in some ways we all take for granted now. This last slide, everyone has seen before. This is called the Blue Marble. Earth from Space taken by a human hand, Apollo 17. And it's reported to be the most downloaded image on the planet. I, I think spaceflight matters to all of us. I think it connects all of us. Certainly from space, I could see Earth in a new light. Uh, Dave Mackay clearly discerned a very thin atmosphere. I'm sure Gary could wax poetic as well. Um, I think this is the start of sort of a global consciousness now. It's, I think it's sort of the beginning of a space age. And I think the more people, the more infrastructure, the more we all go to live in and work in space, the better we will all be. That's sort of what's magic. That's sort of what you know, keeps us going to work. <laughs> uh, and that's been touched on as well by others today. Uh, I think it's important, and I'm very glad that private industry is now participating in that. And in some ways, inventing aspects of that that haven't been invented before. Uh, and we're happy to be here, and we're happy that all of you are interested and in pursuing your education to help. And on that, I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, no. <laughs> you can ask a question as long as it's not about slippers. <laughs> all right. Professor Heaster, Stephen Heaster has the first question. So did you, you said monitors, did you have a heart rate monitor? I did, how, yes. How high did it get? Um, it went no higher than it had in high G training before. I wanna say about 130 beats per minute. Is that a, would that be a, that's about a right number, right? I should know that. Our, our docs I, were perfectly happy. They said it was in the normal band. I think Armstrong's heart, heart rate was 150 when they landed on the moon. Well, he wasn't as cool of a cucumber as I was. <laughs> I know it didn't hit 150. I want to say 130. <laughs> Question. Oh, due respect to Neil. That was a joke, obviously. <laughs> Gary did say he was working at the time. I just saw, just, just saying. <laughs> Neil was working very hard. hard. Yeah. I was too, but I, I know. I, I know. <laughs> um, how many customers would it take for your program to break even on revenue? On, an, on a per-flight basis, we do. In fact, we do better than breaking even. At, uh, so uh, any flight, every flight. 
<laughs> yeah. Can you tell us anything more about the tests that you did? You mentioned strapping in different ways, but can you talk any more about what other things you were testing while you were up? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Uh, let me, let me, so the, everybody can hear the question, right? The question was, tell us about your test. Um, I would divide my test into three different categories. One was actually all the ground prep. I put myself with help through all of our ground pre-flight um, training and procedures that we intend for customers. Uh, and we had timelined those out, and so we figured out whether we needed more or less of something, whether it was effective or not. Um, I, was, I, was, I was pretty much qualified for this flight by everything I've done at NASA and at Virgin Galactic, so this, my training was not to qualify me for this flight, but it was to test the training, so we did that. Uh, and as an example, um, I think I'll spend a little bit more time on suits and gear than I was originally planning, just because even for me, familiar with it all already, it just took a little more time than we anticipated. So I'll add half an hour to that session as a simplistic example. Uh, the second of the three phases of the test uh, were everything associated with being in my seat, strapping in on the ground, being in my seat for climb, uh, for landing. For those phases of flight, we were taking data from my body and from the ship, uh, but I was also doing a regular pattern of ratings to camera. Um, I was the only participant in this test, so there were 11 cameras trained on me, no pressure. Um, and uh, I'm a hobby pilot, I fly, I'm a hobby pilot, and in, in that world, the mnemonic is um, Aviate, Navigate, Communicate. So I developed that for myself for this test as loads thermal lighting. So I just kept up a regular pattern of speaking to camera ratings about what I was feeling for loads, thermal, and lighting, so that I could roll that into training, or if there was some issue with our flight, we could fix it. There was no issue. I mean, we had studied this to death. We knew it would be a, you know, a comfortable human experience, but we wanted to get all the details right. And then the third phase, probably the one you're asking about, is in space. Uh, so among other things, I did unstrap twice, strap back in twice to test different procedures. Um, I also purposely put myself, with advice from doctors and engineers, at various points in the cabin to ascertain how the cabin moved about me as the pilots were steering it with RCS, reaction control system. Uh, in space, they orient the vehicle for the customers. In this case, I was flying with some research payloads on board. Uh, so as they oriented the ship, I was in specific places in the cabin to see how it moved about me. Um, I also specifically went to a few areas of interest in the cabin for Apogee, uh, and specifically translated about the cabin, testing where handholds and aids were to optimize those. Um, let's see, just trying to see if I've covered, uh, what else was there? Uh, and then just generally speaking, weightless in the cabin, I was checking things like spacing and habitable volume, essentially. Uh, it was funny, I'll tell a bit of a joke, I guess. We, um, we had NASA Flight Opportunities Program research payloads on board with me. We started this test earlier than we anticipated we would in the overall test flight program, because all the data from the previous flights was so promising. Uh, but our commercial cabin was not installed yet. Instead, it was a, a research cabin. Um, so I had, to my left, in the three left seats, there weren't seats, there were essentially big racks and lockers. And it turns out, somewhat coincidentally, that's almost exactly the volume of three people in those seats. And so I had roughly the habitable volume of a, of a four-person cabin. Uh, and so I made jokes, nobody would let me put googly eyes and antennas on the racks, but those were my friends. I didn't go to space alone, I had these racks with me, and so I just sort of paid attention to how that worked out and where they were and if I felt I had a lot of volume or not, and I did. I felt like it was incredibly spacious. Once you get up and about the cabin in weightlessness, it's, it's huge, you know, you've got all that vertical space you're not used to using. So there are some examples. Sorry for the long answer. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Trip per person. Oh, thanks. So, how much would it cost per trip per person? And are there any ways that Virgin is kind of looking into ways to make it more accessible to the common person, not just the rich? 
Very good question. Uh, so to date, we've sold tickets, uh, most of them, at a cost of 250,000 US dollars per person. We're not actually selling tickets right now. Uh, we will open back up ticket sales when the time is right, and I expect we'll open those up at a premium price that we haven't yet discussed or disclosed. Um, eventually, though, essentially economies of scale will bring the price down. We are improving our manufacturing capability and bringing a larger fleet online in order to bring that cost down in the longer term. Yeah. I think, I think they gave it to me. Uh, so like time-wise, uh, from the end of the burn of the rocket until Apogee and come back for like when you re-strap, how much time do we have of no weightlessness? You said no weight. Several minutes. Uh, how much is your in-space weightless time is the question. Oh, I don't need to repeat. You have a microphone. Uh, it's several minutes. So our test flight program is going higher each time, which dictates two things, your weightless time and your entry G. The higher you go, the more weightless time you get, but the higher your entry G is. So there's a sweet spot in there, and we're just incrementally growing toward that sweet spot. So when we get to commercial service, it will be several minutes. Uh, mine was a few less than several minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, hi. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the training program, um, normally, uh, for other astronauts, they have to learn a lot about the system um, and be very comfortable with a lot of the engineering aspects. How does that incorporate into the training for, um, uh, I guess, a commercial sense or civilians? Yeah, good question about the training program. So for the rest of our test flights, uh, you know, those test subjects and engineers will be trained to a higher degree. Um, I'm always going to take everyone through the standard three-day customer training program to get better at that, but also supplemental training for future engineers that need to test the cabin. Uh, you know, we, can't, we need a greater passenger density of testing. You can't just always test with one person, right? Um, and then for commercial service, it is a three-day training program. Uh, so I suspect um, as we get toward the end of our test flight program, we will just execute the three-day training program, nothing supplemental, to make sure we understand that. Um, so it, it'll go from more training to less training to the commercial training program. Next question. Uh, so I wonder, can you describe the cabin environment, like uh, the, the size of the cabin and what system would be accessible to the passenger? I can. Um, the cabin, so there are two pilots in the cockpit and the cabin is set up for six people, uh, you know, three along the right side and three along the left side. Um, it's, uh, you know, roughly eight feet diameter, roughly 25 feet long. Uh, it's, it's the size of, you know, an eight-person shuttle bus, essentially. Um, and what systems will be accessible to the customers? By definition, the customer systems will be <laughs> accessible to the customers, and I'm not trying to be cheeky with that answer, but uh, the customers won't have access to uh, the vehicle systems, what you normally think of as vehicle systems. And this is the new thing, you know, this is the new thing. Commercial space travel um, has a distinction between the vehicle systems and the commercial customer systems. Obviously, they have access to their seat and their seat harness, and, you know, it's the same hatch for crew and customers, um, but they don't have access to the flight controls, or the pilot's displays, or you know the electrical system under the floor. I mean, honestly, if you think of a commercial aircraft, you're, that's, it is roughly akin to a commercial aircraft. There's the customer cabin, and then there's the vehicle systems. Okay, one more question is about that. Do you provide any kind of carbon cabin service? Like, would the meal served? <laughs> No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a suborbital flight. There is no meal service. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Can I ask? Yeah. Um, Ma'am, thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, there had been a very unfortunate accident in 2014 involving Enterprise, and the company has obviously been very resilient and bounced back in a big way and achieved so, something so great. What did it take for you to, you know, um, how did you take that accident and what are the lessons that you learned and applied to achieve this far? Uh, something this. Uh, yeah, obviously, 
resilience is key. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that occurred after Enterprise's flight uh, was that Richard Branson and his family doubled down and declared that they would continue this program and continue to fund it. Um, that, that's, that's the big takeaway is keep going. Obviously, there were technical reviews. Uh, Enterprise was being flown by Scaled Composites, a vendor at the time. Uh, after that, we, Virgin Galactic, we took all capabilities in-house uh, and vertically integrated the company, essentially, so that we could revise systems and procedures and practices wherever we needed to in order to overcome uh, anything we found. Um, so we have done that. We've demonstrated successful test flights. We are on our plan, and I am personally exceptionally grateful for the persistence of the Branson family to keep going to improve and get us to this point. So I have two questions. The first one is, you mentioned that you're gonna fly, you flew with uh, scientific payloads. Is this something that is gonna keep going on in your company and it's gonna be accessible? Uh, yes, we offer a research platform for suborbital research. We are continuing to discuss, we, we, we have NASA flight opportunities as a customer. They will fly future NASA flight opportunities research payloads, ironically in shuttle mid-deck lockers, in racks in our vehicle. <laughs> Um, the, uh, and then we are, uh, you know, our, our system can be flown from most anywhere. Uh, so sort of the future's unlimited in terms of who can do what kind of research on our vehicle. We're in discussions about that, uh, but certainly we know we'll be flying NASA Flight Opportunities Program research payloads. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, have you found your vision on the world or something has changed after your experience in, in space flight and looking at the Earth from, from space? Somewhat. Um, that's a tricky question. I am changed, definitely, after having flown. Um, and that's evolved over time. I flew you know, several months ago. Uh, sort of the first thing that happened is we were all extremely relieved that we had made space and taken uh, you know, a test cabin engineer to space. Um, because that's what the whole company had been striving to, to since the day it was founded. And so the fact that we all collectively achieved what we were created to do was a huge celebration. And we all felt relief and changed and proud that we'd all somehow gotten there, not somehow, through a lot of hard work gotten there. Um, I personally came back uh, with a new view of the people around me at, in every way, not just the people I knew. I honestly now sit through meetings and if somebody's being a jerk in a meeting, I don't really care. I'm kind of like, eh, we're all just humans on this pretty planet, and I think of, you know, Earth's diamonds, and I'm like, eh, it'll be fine. Um, I mean, really, yeah, <laughs> maybe those that know me well are grateful for that, I don't know, but, <laughs> um, but, um, but honestly, I mean, if, really honestly, if somebody's being a jerk in a meeting, it doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter, right, you know? Um, but then in a bigger, in a bigger way, um, I feel, I still feel what I felt, and I still, you know, on my deathbed, I will feel that way, and it's emotional. It's not just what I saw or, or, or how I physically felt being weightless. I'd been weightless 600 parabolas before that. Um, it does sink in. It does transform you. I haven't figured out what that means. I mean, I'm, other than, you know, speaking to people and encouraging them and being nice to people in meetings and knowing that it means something big. I'm sort of still on all my post-flight activities. Like I haven't taken a vacation yet. I do wonder when I finally take a vacation and go sit somewhere for two weeks, like how it's gonna hit me, I, I don't know yet. But definitely every, and, and you know, everyone that's ever been to space sort of reports a similar thing. I, Gary's nodding his head, yeah. I need a poet to answer that question. <laughs> Did I say I was a pilot? Yes, um, I'm a private pilot. Thank you to Purdue. I, got, I went through ground school and flight school here because the School of Aero accepted it for graduation credits and I always wanted to fly. Um, so I have a couple of hundred hours in low wing trainer aircraft. I, I, you know, at work we have professional pilots that are top of the top. I am not a professional pilot, I am a hobby pilot, but yeah, I have a couple hundred hours. I love to fly, I fly Grumman's every chance I get.
what advice, I'm not qualified to give advice to pilots who want to become spaceflight pilots. Um, our pilots would probably say, you know, do the best you can, fly fast jets, fly in test programs, that kind of thing. But um, uh, you should, you know, you should, you should, I would think, study websites of the credentials of folks like the Virgin Galactic pilots and the NASA shuttle pilots and, uh, you know, emulate that. Do you want to answer that question? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an engineer. <laughs> Um, how much does Virgin Galactic interact with Virgin Orbit? Oh, so that's a great question. Uh, we have a sister company that's been spun off sort of separately from Virgin Galactic that does uncrewed medium satellite launch or is building toward that. Um, we, we support and are aware, Virgin Galactic is aware of and supports Virgin Orbit's mission, but we don't share um, we share a few underlying services, like one of our pilots flies their carrier aircraft, two of our pilots fly their carrier aircraft. Um, but other than that, we're separate companies. Um, we both share the Virgin brand and uh, you know, Virgin startup capital, uh, but we don't interact in the details of the engineering. Uh, so, since you didn't have a mic, how did, how, did, how did my training compare to my actual space flight? How much of it helped? How much of it didn't? Um, it was very, very analogous, um, intentionally so. Uh, I was never surprised by anything on my space flight other than maybe the emotional aspects. You know, I was kind of floored by how amazing a lot of it was. Um, but I was never surprised by any of the technical environment or the extreme environment or my timeline or anything like that. Um, uh, I'll share a couple of tidbits. I already mentioned that uh, release felt longer than I had, you know, than it had during my training, even though it was spot on in my training and in flight. I mean, there's a bit of time dilation that occurred, um, and so now I know that and can relay that to folks and help train them. Um, and on a sort of comic note, because I can't believe I didn't think of this after all my years at NASA and in Building 9 and everywhere else, Honestly, during boost, maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, halfway through boost to space, I was in a chair. So here, I can even demonstrate. I was seated, you know, 90 degree angles, 90 degree knees roughly, you know, upright chair, uh, straight on my back, flat on my back, headed straight up. And about halfway up, I went, this is weird. I've been lying down for so long that I want to put my legs down. You know, like if you, if you lie down in your bed, you put your legs down, right? And about halfway up, I went, oh, this is weird. I should have put my chair on its back during training. So I'll do that during training. Um, but it was really just little things. Um, and then for our customers that fly, I noticed some visual things that the pilots hadn't told me about before. Um, and so I'll train everyone else in the cabin, just you know what you see when you look out the window and what you can see about the ship. Um, but mostly I'm now able to describe it sort of viscerally in a firsthand way that I would not have been before the flight. Um, how long did the process take from when you strapped in on the ground and then you went up and then landed again? Like, and did oh. you have to go to the bathroom? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I can't believe we made it this far without the bathroom in space question. <laughs> we just got it. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, the whole thing from strap in to unstrap was uh, short of two hours, a little bit short of two hours. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't need to use the facilities. I didn't wear anything special. I just had my breakfast strapped in, did my job, unstrapped, missed lunch because of the press frenzy, and then eventually had lunch and found a bathroom. Um, the, uh, for customers, it'll be about an hour and a half um, from strap in to unstrap because uh, you know, we won't be doing as many, it, it's not a test, we won't be doing as much setup or pre-flight activity. Um, and it, and there is, there's no meal service on board, there's also nothing else on board, <laughs> if you catch my drift. Um, but for customers, if they would like to wear something, they're welcome to. Oh, wait, there was one right here. Yeah. yeah. Just so for us as engineers here, what opportunities are there for us to be involved in Virgin Galactic's next steps? 
we have a careers website that we would encourage you to apply to. And we have an intern program. And I wouldn't just look at Galactic, Virgin Galactic. I would also look at the other private space flight companies, <laughs> uh, as well as Virgin Orbit. And also, we have a manufacturing company that employs far more people than our operations company. They're called the Spaceship Company, the Spaceship Company, TSC. Uh, and they have uh, more opportunities for engineers just by quantity, more opportunities for engineers uh, than Galactic does. We are, Galactic is the space line operator and TSC is the manufacturing and design agency. And so uh, you can look at all of those. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> um, I was just wondering, I guess, like what is Virgin Galactic's next steps? And like, what does your timeline look like? Great question. Uh, we are going to finish moving everyone to New Mexico. I mentioned that I already started moving. And we're going to move our spacecraft, Unity, to New Mexico. It's currently finishing its outfitting in California, getting its commercial interior installed so that people don't have to fly with payloads like I did. <laughs> um, uh, and then once we get uh, everything set up and operational in New Mexico, we'll have a few more test flights. Um, but the big next thing is starting commercial service. I am dying to bring this to everyone, especially to Sir Richard, who you know, started this and has been so patient. Um, so the next big thing in my world is to start to do what I hired on to do, train people to fly in the cabin. I have only trained myself. That's a poor man's job description, right? Uh, so I'm very eager to train the rest of our cabin evaluators and then Sir Richard for the first commercial flight and then all of our founders, which are our early customers, and uh, and the rest of our customers. We'll start commercial service uh, next summer. Next summer. What other companies are out at Spaceport America and what, what are they doing, if there are oh. any others? What other, that's a great question. Um, so Virgin Galactic is the anchor tenant at Spaceport America. Uh, we occupy the hangar that you saw. Um, the New Mexico Spaceport Authority is the other entity in that building. They occupy a small part of it um, for uh, field trips and tours and inspiration. Um, so those are the only two entities that operate in that building you saw. Spaceport America has a vertical launch facility and host ev hosts events. I don't know of companies that are resident, like with full-time employees at the vertical launch facility. There might be, but I'm, I'm not an expert, sorry. Um, but uh, Spaceport America does host various annual events, the most prominent of which Purdue participates in, and that's the Spaceport Cup, which is a student rocket launch competition. So all that is going on. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. It's just gorgeous out there. I'm amazed. Hi. So Hi. Um, you mentioned you have a lot of founders, like 600 founders. Um, are any of them from other countries other than America? And is Virgin Galactic interested in international markets as well? Yes, we have over 600 ticketed customers. Uh, we call the first roughly 100 our founders. Uh, the rest are, our, we call voyagers and pioneers. Our founder, singular, is Richard Branson. Um, but broadly speaking, in that customer base of over 600, we have 60 different countries represented, many of which have never flown one of their citizens to space. So many of those countries are inaugurating their human spaceflight programs through Virgin Galactic. Um, uh, we do obviously have international, uh, an international flavor, uh, our work staff and our customer base, but we also have a system and architecture that can be flown from roughly any runway. So the idea of a country incorporating this into their, you know, nationality is appropriate. In fact, we're talking with two countries that want to bring our system to their country right now. Yeah, it's very international. It's very international. <laughs> Any other questions or have we petered out? I don't even know where we are on time. Go ahead. Did you design the like flight path that they that your ship takes or do you like what do you do for the path design that's just <laughs> that is a really good question and very expertly asked <laughs> what do you do <laughs> it's a great question <laughs> um, 
So obviously what I did in February is not my, you know, for six years, that's not what I've been doing for six years. Um, so no, I did not design our trajectory, nor did I design our architecture. Um, you know, that, that predated me. And that was all uh, essentially a scaling up of Spaceship One and White Knight One, which were the XPRIZE winning uh, private, non-commercial, but private spacecraft many years ago. Um, the first fully privately funded spacecraft in space was Spaceship One. Uh, 2014, no, 2004, I want to say. Uh, we are a scaled up version of that. Uh, so what do I do? Uh, so my primary job is to design the training for our cabin evaluators and all of our customers and design and, and have built all the systems necessary for that. A cabin mock-up, um, a, you know, all the training versions of suits and gear. Uh, so, like the first day I started at work over six years ago, my boss said, okay, you need to hire another instructor and you need to go get a mock-up of the ship built suitable for customer training. I said, great. And so then I had to go figure out what that had to look like. Like, what systems does it need? You know, how accurate does it need to be? Where does it need to be accurate and why? What fidelity does it have to have? Does it have to be a motion-based simulator or can it be a fixed-based simulator or in between? It's in between. Um, and what are the key bits of the flight that we really need folks to experience on the ground or in some other way before they fly? So I designed all that and got all that built. And then we relocated it to New Mexico and I used it to train myself. So that's sort of my primary job. Um, I also along the way was asked to lead the cabin interior program because the prior program manager was promoted and I had very relevant experience from space station design and engineering days. So for a period of a few years, I led the team that was designing and engineering the customer cabin, the seat, the seat belt, the walls, you know, you name it. Um, there are many stakeholders in that mix, the doctors, the marketing team, the brand design team, the industrial designers, all these are new things in commercial world that we didn't have in NASA days. <laughs> Um, and of course, engineers. Um, so I did lead that, t that team for a time until it was time to step away and focus back on the training and the test flight program. Now what I'm doing is advising that team on sort of how to finish out the commercial outfitting, but primarily training people to evaluate the cabin. And it's more than training, I suppose I'm underselling myself a little bit. Um, I write those test plans. I've got the, I authored the objectives for the cabin tests. I group them into tests. You know, if there's one person on board, what can they test? If there's four people on board, what can they test? And how can they most efficiently do that without getting in each other's way? Although at some point, we do need to test interactions within the cabin. So when do we do that most efficiently? So I write all those procedures and timelines, and then I train people for those. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. This, this one. Um, so it looked in the pictures like it was a, a shirt sleeve environment. Is that, is that gonna continue to be the case once it becomes operational? Yes, it is a shirt sleeve environment. Uh, our, our suits are not pressure suits. Uh, they are Nomex, but they're not pressure suits and that will continue in commercial service. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I was curious about previous, you said you're, you're an aerospace engineer. Um, what particular skills or experiences helped you come to the position where you were doing, uh, like actually going into space and, you know, getting to be that test engineer spot? Uh, well, so the things that qualified me to be assigned to that flight were essentially all my extreme environment test experience from my NASA days and my Virgin Galactic days. Uh, I had over 600 parabolas doing research and testing of hardware at both NASA and Virgin Galactic in six different types of parabolic aircraft, plus thousands of neutral buoyancy dives at different pools around the world, and the design of those tests, plus a whole bunch of chamber B and glove box, and a whole bunch of extreme test environment experience. Plus, also, as the chief astronaut instructor, it makes a bit of sense to make sure I can instruct from a first-hand basis. But um, I, would, I would say my test engineering experience is what primarily qualified me for that flight. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Beth, for uh, the wonderful presentation and the answers to the questions. Uh, I think we're wrapping up here. We've got a coffee break and a social session here or networking session.
Next. Thank, thanks again, Beth. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.